Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's Lunch and Learn session. Today's topic is on application checkup, upgrades, and archives with presenter Jerry Fitt. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so if you have questions, please type them into the questions box on the screen, and we will address them at the end of the session. This webinar will be recorded, and we will email a copy out to everyone within a few days. I will now turn it over to you, Jerry. Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully it's not raining where you are. It's pouring where I am right at the moment. Um, thank you for joining the webinar, and we're going to talk about upgrades and archives on your Sage 300 system. So um, one of the things we're going to go over right away is talking about the uh, agenda just quickly. I'll give you a little bit about my background. We'll go over the upgrades, migrations, data archives, system checkups, and network assessments. So just for the people that I haven't worked with, and there's a number of people that I've worked with on this uh, on our guest list that are attending already, um, I have 30 years of experience in IT. I'm the Cordon's Director of Technology Services, which means I do most of the um, upgrades and installations and uh, technical issues that arise in, uh, in customers. Uh, I went to Hofstra University. I have a business degree. I'm a systems analyst. Um, I work with companies firsthand up with up to like 2,200 employees. I have experience in construction, um, wholesale distribution, service industry, professional services, engineering, manufacturing, almost every almost every uh, asset, probably everything except banking. Um, and I've been working with Sage 300 since 2008. All right, Sage 300 upgrades. Why should you upgrade and or keep current with the cert, um, a version of Sage 300? First thing is enhancements. With your Sage support, you're entitled to get free support software upgrades. So there's no reason not to be on the latest version. You'll find enhancements that can be very useful, and one of them to use, um, for example, is inactivating old vendors. That's something that was available, I think, in version 13.1. And the people that didn't upgrade from 12.1 to 13.1 didn't get that upgrade. So it was a way of going in and up marking your vendors, not deleting them, just marking them as inactive, and they removed them from your reports and your ability to enter invoices against them to prevent data entry errors. Enhancements like that make you more productive, and they're constantly doing enhancements to make the software better. One of the technical reasons why you want to do your upgrades is at the end of every calendar year, Sage started this, I believe, last year or the year before. They only support two versions when they do the year end. This year will be 14.1 and 15.1. 15.1 is not even available yet, and based upon what I've heard, it probably won't be available until the fourth quarter. Um, and in um, So I guess that means September, October range. But I haven't gotten an exact release date on that. I wouldn't recommend going on a bleeding edge and going to 15.1 or any of the latest versions. I always recommend that everybody wait at least 30 days till we go on the current version. There will be patches and updates inevitably that come out after the upgrade is installed and you want to wait. So don't be on the bleeding edge. Be on what we know works. So anybody that's currently on 13.1 or 12.1, uh, I would recommend that they be upgrading to 14.1 at this time. With the update grades, you get all the latest accounting updates. Every um, fourth quarter of every year, there's a year-end re um, release. That release in handles all the custom forms that normally get done for the year-end uh, government reporting, like 1099s, W-2s, also um, tax table calculations, not just tax table updates, but there may be changes in the way taxes are calculated, and you need the newest um, versions to do that. Another one that recently came up was in payroll was the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, the ability to track that in the software now. How do you know what version you're on? From the Sage desktop, you just hit the select help about, and it'll tell you on that screen. From the TS main, you select help about TS main, and it tells you the version. Here's a print screen of that, and the key part to um, look at is where it says next the accounting update in the parentheses. 14.1 is the version. REV3 stands for Revision 3. That means the CD version that was originally installed from, and it's Accounting Update 2. So that's the version um, that I'm currently running on the, this machine in this example. Same thing will show up in um, TS Main. It shows up 14.1 REV3 Accounting Update 2. 
you don't have to worry about the version in the beginning, which has 14.1.19. Um, that's pretty irrelevant. And maybe Sage will ask you that if you ever on the phone with them. But most people uh, that don't reference that at all. Okay. Sage 300 upgrades. How do you know what versions are available? Um, Sage emails customers when the latest version and or accounting updates are released. If you're not on the email list from Sage, please get yourself signed up for it. There's definitely somebody in your office that's on your Sage account and is getting those emails, but they may not be prop going to the proper person. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting them. That's also, if you're not sure what the latest version is, you can always shoot an email to um, a cordon and find out what the latest version is. My contact information is at the end of this, or you can contact our office to, uh, and they'll always know. System upgrades can be very complicated, and you should not do them yourself unless you're knowledgeable about all the necessary steps. And that includes me. What I'm saying from that is you need to have Sage experience and have done it before. In one of those things about the upgrade, you need to take into account all ancillary or third-party add-ins um, that you are currently running. More and more, there's add-ins being added to the software that enhance features such as Puracle for print che printing checks. Timber scan for scanning invoices, etc. Those always need to be taken into account. Um, the versions um, of those particular software may need to be upgraded. There's usually an upgrade method for those applications, um, and you need to coordinate them with that vendor. For like, for example, Puracle, if you upgrade the version 14.1 and you're going from an older version, you need to upgrade that version of Puracle, and you'll need to upgrade your Puracle database to bring that information over. Uh, according to offers the upgrade services, your, um, your outside IT company you often does not have a lot of Sage experience, and they may tell you that they can figure it out. I, do you want to take that chance with your accounting data? It's a much more complicated upgrade than copying Word or Excel files, and I say that because of uh, experience that I've had with um, outside IT companies where they just say, okay, we'll just copy all the files and drag them over, and they drag all the Sage programs over and the Sage data over, and they expect it to work like they were migrating Microsoft Office, and it's just not that simple. It doesn't work. Okay. Um, next thing is server migrations. As your server gets older, it'll, nest, it'll get slower, the performance will go down, and you uh, need to plan on replacing them occasionally. According to the computer manufacturers, and they're selling the equipment, remember that. They always say you should be replacing your computers in three years. I, I have no problem with any recommended that you can stretch them at least five years. And uh, that's the comfortable number that I would tell. And I know there's many customers that go longer than that. When you replace your server, you will need to migrate your programs and data from the old server to the new one. This is not a simple copy of files like you can do with Word and Excel. And I'm just repeating that again because it's that important at that point is uh, stress. Server migrations and upgrades can be complicated and the same. this is the same exact s slide as far as doing the upgrade that they should not be done unless you know uh, Sage software in and out. Again it's the same thing with the ancillary third-party products and we offer that service to uh, um, as, a, as a service from Accordion. Now that service of course is not covered under your Sage support maintenance is covered under uh, accordant and it is billable time just to make that clear with everybody that uh, we're not going to do a migration or an upgrade it's for free it's chargeable and I'm sorry about that um, data archives um, before that oh, one thing I forgot to mention I'm sorry to go back with the system upgrades when you as version upgrades those are free you're entitled to do for the software upgrade um, in your sage maintenance that you pay for Sage. So there is no cost to get those uh, upgraded service programs. The only cost would be is if you have a cord and do the migration or the upgrade. All right, data archives. Uh, very often I go into an account and I'll be helping them with their server and we'll go into accounts payable and we'll look at an accounts payable inquiry and they'll have 12 years worth of information in their accounts payable inquiry file. Um, so it makes the system run slow in that application and it just makes the system run slower. So what the data archive is takes the, uh, items from your current file and moves them to your history file. So in Sage themselves, there's three files. If you go into a screen inquiry, most of them will ask you, it prompts you, do you want to look at the new file, the current file, and the history file. The new file are your entries that have not been posted. 
So you may see general ledger entries or payroll entries in the new file that haven't been posted. The current file contains posted entries that have not been moved to the history file. For most people, that's all their transactions that they've ever done with the system if they've never done a doc data ac archive. The history file contains posted entries that have been moved from the current file to the history file. So that's a manual process and it's an, um, a, not an automatic application that happens. You have to physically take the options that say move records from your current file to your history file in order to make that happen. So when you go into a screen inquiry and click on your history file, it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be records there. You might even get an error saying that the file doesn't exist. The only way that gets created is when you move records from the current file to the history file. So the history file is up to you to make um, to decide when you're going to move entries. Again, we want the, some of the reasons you want to do your archives is that makes the system run faster. You go into accounts payable inquiry, you see 12 years worth of data, and if you're looking for a specific invoice and you have a um, accounts payable clerk running, rolling through 12 pages worth of invoice detail to find an invoice that she's on with the customer and he hasn't given you the correct information and you're looking for an invoice from whatever time period for a certain amount, they don't know the invoice number, they will be much more, less data to look at when you only have a certain number of years to go through that. So that's how it makes the users more productive. And reports run faster. Accounts receivable reports will run faster, payroll, job costing. Uh, historically, those reports, when they get a lot of um, data in them that are, aren't archived, you'll see the performance be degraded on them, especially accounts receivable job costing and payroll reports. If you have 12 years of data in the current file, those programs read, so just so you understand why this is, every time that you go in, if you have 12 years of data in your current file, the programs read all that data and display it when you run a screen or a report. So even if the, you run a report and say, I want to run it from January 1st, 15 to today, it reads every record from 1998 or whenever you started the system and looks at all those current records and says should I internally should I include this record on the report nope go to the next one should I include this record on the report nope go to the next one so those make the running of applications reports screen inquiries be much much slower okay the recommendation that we do on uh, data archives is we run the data archives at year-end times so you do your data year-end for 2015, and at that time you would run your data archives. So you already have a data um, dedicated system to um, run your year-end. It's a good time to do it. We recommend keeping two years of data in your current data file, which is your current file. For example, when you close the year-end for 2014, you would move all entries up to 1231.12 to the history file. As the year moves along, you would have all of your 2013, 2014, and 2015 transactions in the current file, which means to, technically you have two years plus in your current file. At the end of the year, you would have three years there. So then at the year end for 2015, you would move the entries from the current file to history file up to 12, 31, 13, and then you would only have the entries from 14 to 15, and so on at every year end. documentation. As far as how to um, do the data archives, that can be a little bit um, complicated when you first time you run it. What we do is we run uh, the directions that we follow is a chapter in the year-end guide. It explains how the data archive works and it's released every year-end. It has step-by-step -step instructions on how to archive your data. Um, some notes that you may have to have a dedicated system to archive your data. Accordant can write a specific data archival plan for your company. The reason we do that is because when you look at the documentation for the data archives, it can be rather um, convoluted as far as all the applications. And if you're going to archive job costing data and project management data, there's certain methods and uh, procedures that need to be done as far as how to do it and um, the, whether you're better off building a data folder or archiving it from your current folder to your history folder, there are options with the data archives. So if we put come together what the customer needs, we write a plan and then it's something for them to follow every year. 
So the first year that you do it, you may want to have a coordinate run up for you to avoid any issues. Okay. System checkups. Um, a lot of things happens with your system as it runs along. The biggest one is the server, radar, server operating systems. For example, Windows 2003 is no longer supported by Microsoft. You'd be surprised how many people still have Windows 2003 supported running their servers. If, um, when they say it's not supported by Microsoft, that means if you have a system error or if you have, um, there's no more security updates coming out, there's no more patches coming out, if you have a system error with 2003, you'll have a very hard time getting any support and keeping your server up and running. You don't want to take that chance. You want to upgrade your servers to the latest operating systems or the currently supported operating systems. The easiest way to do that is a server migration. It's really not an easy way to take a Windows 2003 server and upgrade it to 2008 or 2012 because at that time your server is probably outdated and the um, hardware that's in that server will, is not supported in those operating systems. So that when your operating system is that old, you're really going to need to be considering a server upgrade. Also, um, Windows 2003 is no longer supported by Sage. So 14.1 won't even run on it. When you try and install 14.1 on Windows 2003, it stops you and says this operating system is not supported and you can't even continue it. It's not like a warning that you get sometimes on a system saying it's not supported but you can install it. This one will stop it and not let it, let it run at all. That's a little bit different um, than certain me messages. One of them when you're installing uh, the workstation operating systems, for example, Windows XP is no longer supported by Microsoft or Sage. So when you go to install 14.1, 14.1, certain versions of XP, it tells you you can't do it and it stops you and you're not allowed to do the install. There are versions of the operating system that are technically not supported on the workstation, but they will run. One of them is like Microsoft Home Edition. I don't know why people buy Home Edition machines for their office, but some do. And It'll give you a warning saying it's not supported, but it will allow you to run. Um, when you do this system checkups and you look at your system, there's a um, hardware requirements that tell you what the latest version is available. So you want to make sure what the normal requirements are for version 14.1. It'll tell you how much memory you're supposed to have, how much uh, operating system, what operating system you're supposed to have. For example, your workstations are supposed to have 4 gigs of memory in them uh, at a minimum. Your server is supposed to have at least 8 gigs of memory in them at a minimum. And you want to make sure that those um, conform to those system requirements. Those system requirements you can get from the Sage knowledge base um, at, or from Accordant. Well, just a point on the Sage knowledge base. With um, your Sage support, if a lot of people are not familiar with the Sage knowledge base. Where once they have a user ID and they can go into the Sage Knowledge Base which, and search for articles on system requirements, upgrade versions, and things of that nature, that's the best way to, to get them and be on the latest knowledge uh, available. Hard disk space. Um, you need to monitor your hard drive space on your server. A lot of people don't do that in, on a regular basis. If they have an internal IT to com company, they usually do. If they have an external IT company, usually they have a monitoring system that will do that. But the recommendation is that you don't want to exceed 80% 80, 80 capacity on your hard drive. When you start doing that, your system runs slower um, because it's swapping um, storage from different drives back and forth. And, in the, and then there was a time when we used to use defrag. It was a program that would defragment data and put it all together in blocks. That's why you don't want to have more than 80% on your server. If your server drive becomes full, the server will crash and you will not be able to get it started. So in other words, if you fill up your drive to 100%, the machine will shut down and you will not be able to get it to boot up. Not a, not a pleasant thing to go through. Okay. Um, virus protection. A lot of people install virus protection, which obviously you have to have that now. Um, you want to make sure that you have the latest versions for whatever applications you have, whatever version you have. Um, and you want to make sure your virus protection, protection is up to date on your server and your workstation. Have your IT company verify that your virus protection excludes the Sage directories. 
there's a performance issue if you are doing virus protection and don't have exclusion on the Sage directories because every time it reads files from the hard disk on the server or the workstation, it'll be checking those files, which slows down your user interface where um, it can make it almost to the point that you'll get um, database errors as far as saying I can't read the da database if you have some virus protection that really locks it on. Those exclusions um, need to be put in to increase that performance and they're in the SAGE knowledge base so you can contact the court about um, what those exclusions should be. Another item that we do is um, network assessments. Um, we do um, an accord and offers that service that will go through and analyze your network and make recommendations of how to prove your network performance. Now that's mostly related to the Sage operating system and um, the Sage applications. But we'll go over to make sure all the system requirements are made, are, I'm sorry, are met, to make sure that we are going to upgrade what is available. If you're experiencing performance issues, what could be causing those performance issues. Um, we'll verify your operating system, your processor, your memory, um, make sure you have the virus protection software, check your um, exclusions, and then we'll write a report of those findings and recommendations that you should be, um, that we recommend you go with and be talking with your IT company. I feel like I talked through this presentation really fast. So I'm up to the point of, of questions, and hopefully there are some questions at this time. Yes. We have one question um, so far. If you do have a question, please type it into the questions box and we'll be happy to answer it for you. First question is, if we have never archived, oldest transactions are 2011, is there a downside to archiving 2011 and 2012 now and then doing 2013 in concert with year and, and process to get on the suggested schedule? The, um, the, there is no downside to doing it. It's just that you want to get on a schedule of doing it yearly. So there's no down, downside to doing 2011 now and then doing 2012 at the end of the year. Um, as a matter of fact, if you have 12 years with the data as an example, I recommend that you do like two years at a time so that you, if you run into time constraints with having the server down, you can stop it and then pick it up at another time where you have the ability to have a dedicated server. So, so no, there's no, uh, no downside to doing that. Okay, the next question is when archiving, does this archive attachments as well? Yes. It archives, it archives attachments and moves them from the related record. Okay, next question is archiving job cost is by job, right? How do you know? to do that on the calendar year as recommending? In job costs, when you do the archive, you, you more or less you select the jobs that you want to archive. So it'll bring up a list and you specifically tell it what's jo which job to archive. So you're not going to have it just go over everything from 2011 prior because you really don't know if the status of the job, if it's closed, open. So you physically select which jobs you want to archive. Okay, the next question is, would you discuss the changes made in version 14.1? Have they improved any of the any of the archiving features? For instance, can we archive tenants and properties as well as leases? That I'm not 100% sure about. Property management uh, is one of the archive processes that I haven't run, so I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that one. We'd have to get back to you with that one. Property management one is one of the applications that I don't... Um, I'm not an expert in, so that one I've never done, and I'd have to get back to you. I do. I have. I have the contact person, so we'll get back to you. Um, does archiving get done at the server by IT or by the administrator at the workstation? You want to do it at the server, so you have a dedicated because you need a dedicated application. Um, you need a dedicated application where nobody can be using it. Best place to do that is on the server where you can go into the server, you can run the Sage um, pervasive microkernel, which looks at the monitor, which looks at who signed on. You verify that you're the only one that signed on. You have a complete setup of the files, and then you would run it there. 
And you want to do it there because if you're running on the server, it's reading the files directly on the server. You're not going through the network to do it. So I would do it on the server. Okay, the next question is, I was told archiving slows the search process and that the user needs to look in different buckets, which makes it difficult for jobs lasting over years or reviewing vendor history. Vendor, on a job cost report, whenever you run the reports, it asks you if you want to include the current or the history file. So you can just run it for the current file or s select both if you're looking at a job that uh, goes across multiple years. So it won't slow down the performance um, if you didn't archive. If you didn't archive, it would take that long all the time. If you were looking for an old job and you select the history file, it would run just like you didn't archive. Well, that, that might have been a confusing answer. Does that make sense, Krista? I don't know because I don't use the program. <laughs> <laughs> um. Let me try that one more time. When, um, when you go into a job costing report, first off, the year-to-date, job-to-date transaction totals will always be there. There's no um, breakdown saying that the job-to-date transactions up this is 2011, they were archived and the job-to-date totals don't match. So that, num that number one doesn't change. If you're running a job cost report and you only select the current files, it'll only read the current files and the performance will be better. If you select to run the current and the history at the same time, it'll run the same speed as if you never did the data archive. Hopefully that's a clearer answer. That makes sense. Okay, the next question is, will 15.1 have the capability to push out updates to workstations? I'd like to say yes. That has been in the Sage software for a number of years. To be honest, it doesn't work well, and I haven't heard them um, developing 15.1 to say that it's going to support that any better. So from a technical standpoint, I would say no. From a sales standpoint, they would tell you yes. Okay. Um, another question is, when I tried to archive service without it, would not archive any work order associated with an agreement? Does that slow down the system? The agreement invoices, the agreements in um, service management, you correct, do not get archived. So the work orders will only, in when you archive, will only take the ones that weren't related to that. I guess if you have thousands of agreements out there, um, you won't see as much of a performance advantage as if you didn't have agreements. But usually you have agreements and you have regular transactions, meaning uh, time and materials and a lot of small work orders if you're using service management and also be archived. So it's going to increase the performance no matter what. And the next question is, what has Accordance clients experience been with 14.1? Is it stable? Any problems? Also, will all modified crystal reports need work? In When 14.1 first came out, there were some issues with crystal reports. That was the really the only issue that I was aware of with the migrations that we went to 14.1. The um, Sage has fixed those issues. The only time you get an issue now is if there's a feature that was used in the ver previous version of crystal that is not supported in the newer version. And I would say most migrations that I do, there's very few reports that don't, if any, that don't convert. Uh, I've probably done, I don't know, in the last month at least 20 mic upgrades, and I think I had two customers that had one or two reports that wouldn't be upgraded by the system automatically. Okay. Next question is, is there a report indicating which years have been archived by module? No. You have to look at the data, and the best way is to look at the inquiry. Next question, if we were on 13.1, should we upgrade to 14.1 before we archive if we have never archived before? I don't think there's any difference, and I would, wouldn't relate the two, so you're not going to see a difference in the archival process. So I wouldn't let that be a, a hindrance to do that. You could do it now or after. Okay, next question. When should a company create a new data folder transfer history to history files, which frees up the current data folder. 
that's a recommendation based on data sizes. But if you have project management and, that, and job costing, the only way to archive project management is to do it to a different data folder. So you would have to do for, you'd have to make a new data file, archive the project management to the from basically to the history folder in a separate data folder, and then you would archive the uh, corresponding jobs with that to it. That's um, hope that makes sense. Okay. Next question is um, when will the cloud version be released of Sage three hundred? I that guess means? so. There's no. I think. Um, there is not a version of cloud of Sage 300 that's going to run in the cloud. As far as natively, you can host it in the cloud by run, um, running it on a hosted server environment. That's available today. But as far as Sage 300 running strictly in the cloud, in the cloud where it's uh, running on a Sage service software as a service environment. That has uh, not been developed, and I know they talk about it, but there's no definite plan that I know of for that. Okay, and the next question is, what version of Crystal would you need to run with 14.1? Uh, the number, um, I think it's Crystal Reports 11. But if you have Crystal Reports, um, already and I, and this doesn't mean you need crystal reports the for, with the application you come with the crystal reports viewer to run the application when you go to the new version it comes with the new version of crystal reports viewer to run it if you own crystal reports uh, designer that's for previous version and it's licensed through sage you get that upgrade for free to run the 14 one I think it's version 11 or 12 that runs the new version. I don't recall the number. I know it says SAP all over it when you load it. <laughs> okay, the next question is, are there any special considerations when running Sage 300 in a cloud-hosted environment? The advantage of using it in a cloud-hosted environment is that you no longer have to maintain the hardware. Um, you're having somebody else who is in a, has a data center run the applications on their hardware. They also have built-in replication services um, as far as multiple locations so that you would almost never have to worry about having the server go down. They, the, it, I, you access the applications through the internet. Usually um, the hosting companies will have like three different ways of accessing the internet. So they'll have a backup line from say Verizon Cable Vision, I'm just using these examples in the Northeast, Cable Vision and Comcast. So if one of their providers goes down, which is ultimately the pipe that you're using to, to get to there, um, they have an automatic backup. As far as a, a negative about hosting it in the cloud, um, it is you're paying a monthly fee, a lease fee. You're renting their hardware, more or less, or leasing it. So that fee never goes away as opposed to where if you bought a server and you took out a three-year lease payment and at the end of the three years you own it at year four and year five, you would not have any payment. Whereas if you're hosting it in the cloud, you would have that payment. That payment would continue. But you would have it running on hardware that would be supported the whole time. So if the hardware was up outdated, you would get the new version of hardware for free because you're already paying for it. Okay. Um, what type of broadband with width slash speed would you need to achieve good performance? It's really um, you're not going to when you're running in the cloud, you're just running off a terminal server, which I'll, I'll use that term. So what you're seeing on Sage is just on your screen. It's just images of what's running on the server. So you don't get, it's not like when you're running Sage locally. When you're running Sage locally in your office, you're, you have the application installed on your machine and it's communicating with the server to read the data and how fast the application runs on your, your machine as well as how fast the server runs and how fast your network goes through affects the performance. When you're host running it on a 
posted applications, you only get screenshots, meaning, and you wouldn't even know the difference. So it passes an image, not the actual program, every time you go into an inquiry or a report function. So it runs much, much quicker. You can actually get away with running um, a DSL line, um, depending on your office and how many people there are. I've seen customers doing that, and DSL say that you, most you can get up to two is, I'm going to say one meg. I've never, I haven't seen many faster than that. Faster than that, but most people have now. Say they have cable vision or opt online. They have a hundred meg, and that's more than more than sufficient. And in addition to hosting it in the cloud, you take that computer, you can run it anywhere. So you don't need to have Timberline installed on your laptop and plug it in. You can be at your neighbor's house, go into their internet, go on their browser, and get to your Sage software. Okay. That looks like all the questions we have. Um, so if you do have other questions, our contact information is here on the screen. Feel free to contact us after the webinar. Um, again, we want to thank everyone for attending today's session. We will be emailing out this presentation to all of you later on today. And if you have any other questions, feel free to contact us. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.